are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the maddening case of Ellie Butler. This involves a little girl, a broken system, and a tragic outcome. If this could have been prevented, why wasn't it? And how many have to end up like this before we realize something needs to change? I post so much content like this because it is my passion to tell these stories and as you know i mean no harm to anyone i talk about i truly do it to shed light on the victims and if you want to support me please do subscribe please thumbs up leave a nice comment it would mean the world. So it was 2013 in London and the Butler family lived in Sutton. Now this family was pretty small consisting of Jeannie and Ben who were the parents and their two children. They had a six-year-old daughter named Ellie May and then a younger sibling who is not really talked about. Ben and Jeannie had met at a party and they had started to have children. They had an instant connection. Ellie was born on December 30th of 2006 and was a complete ray of sunshine. She had the most bubbly personality, loving heart. She was sweet. She was energetic. She was outgoing. She had so many friends in class and she often did like extracurricular activities because she constantly wanted to be doing something and around people. She was like the definition of an extrovert. Just looking at her, you can tell her smile is the most genuine and it just fills the world with kindness and to be so happy, so genuinely joyful after a life that hasn't been so kind is I think the most brave a person can be, the most resilient that they can be. And I mean, Ellie was constantly playing outdoors, whether that was with her grandparents in their garden, whether that was just with toys, or whether she was inside creating new shows and being just imaginative. She was constantly creating. She also wanted to be an artist and drew lots of different pictures for family members and she constantly wanted to make them cards. However, a lot of the times it's found that the most creative, imaginative people do so to create a world that is not their own, to escape their own. On October 28th, 911 would be called at around 2.46 from the Butler apartment. Now, Ben was on the phone to the 911 operator screaming that his daughter wasn't breathing properly and they needed an ambulance immediately. Now, you could hear them doing the CPR quite loudly. They were panicking. And when the ambulance got there, and it was minutes later, and Ellie had already passed away. She was pronounced dead at 4.01. Her cause of death, a brain and skull injury. Now her parents said that she must have fallen off something while she was playing and gotten hurt, but coroner said it wasn't that kind of injury, that this would have had to been done by someone's hand. Done with the force of someone doing it to her. I mean, it was horrific. Ellie's back of her skull had been caved in as though she had been struck. And of course, the first place to look for suspects is the parents. And in this case, they had a right to. Investigators immediately arrested the father, Ben, who had been with her at the time she had passed. And they questioned him, asking him if he struck her with an object or possibly threw her against the wall and hurt her, or just to tell them what had happened, but he denied everything. You see, this wasn't the first time Ben was being accused of hurting his daughter. Ellie had been born December 30th, 2006, and six weeks later would be taken back to the hospital where she would have several head injuries that had caused internal bleeding. And it appeared as though she had been shaken. Her father was with her that evening and said that all he did was place her in her car seat next to him while he did some work. The next thing he knew, he looked over and she was kind of slumped over and floppy in her car seat. And that's when he rushed her to the hospital. At this point, 
The doctors had found that there was also burn marks on her forehead and her fingers and social services was called in and they were asked to investigate further and so they did they interrogated the parents they interrogated the grandparents and this was neil and linda gray and they were ellie's mother's parents Ellie's grandparents. Neil said at one point Ben had talked to him about being blamed for doing something to Ellie after she was put in the hospital and that the burn marks were only because she had rolled too close to a radiator where he put her to keep her warm and that's how she got them. It was self-inflicted is what he was trying to say of this baby. Thankfully at this point Ellie would recover and she was going to be sent home However, the only problem was investigators were still looking into this to make sure there was no foul play. So they arrested Ben Butler at this time and they also would have Ellie be taken by social services and put into foster care. Linda and Neil, her grandparents, begged for Ellie to just be able to go to them. They were denied. I mean, you have to have certain paperwork to be foster parents, yes. But family members, it is different and you can get them a bit sooner. But her grandparents were completely denied and she was put into a foster home. Now, this foster family did a wonderful job with Ellie during the time that they had her. They took care of her. They let the grandparents visit. The only problem is social services is very strict on visitation and if you've never dealt with him you don't know how difficult it really is every time they wanted to pick her up they were shadowed and had to be like helped and this is something that her grandparents were very okay with because they knew or they thought they were just trying to protect Ellie. At this point, her father, Ben, was still being looked into. It had been ruled that Ellie's injuries were non-accidental and theorized that Ben had been the one to hurt his daughter. This wasn't even the first time that he had been being looked into. He had actually been convicted for imitation and robbery as well as assaulting a previous pregnant girlfriend. And he had served three years in prison. So did Ellie's mother know that Ben had hurt Ellie? What was her stance on all of this? Because she would be questioned too. She didn't really say what she believed, only that Ben wouldn't do such a thing. And that is where she left it. And because Jeannie was taking the possible abuser's side, she was not giving custody of her daughter back at this time she was still in foster care. They actually decided to give temporary custody to Ellie's grandparents, Linda and Neil, and they were ecstatic at this point. They were in their 60s. They had already raised Jeannie, but they were so excited to be able to do it again, and it was almost like this new sense of life getting to raise their granddaughter even for a little bit and neil was a bit nervous because it had been years since he had done this but linda said anything you've forgotten i will teach you we can do this together and they really were just the best team and the best place that ellie could be at this point but the problem was social services was still giving her parents rights to visitation even though they weren't sure exactly who harmed her or why. And they would set up times and dates to meet with Linda and Neil to see Ellie. However, they rarely showed up to these. Linda and Neil were always there with Ellie waiting, but it was said that about 70% of the time, her parents were a no-show for no reason. And then sometimes, Ben would show up at their door really late at night asking to see Ellie, and they would say, I'm sorry, she's already asleep. You can't come in. Linda and Neil were told to take account of everything, write notes on it, record everything that was happening between them and the parents. That way they could take it to court as far as, you know, custody and all of that and how the parents really treated Ellie and them during this time. And this is something that a lot of foster parents feel actually. Like you're constantly on a record, that you're constantly being monitored when you were just trying to help and it's something that's infuriating for the people who are just trying to do good when on the other hand you have the parents ben and Jeannie, who 
are thought to be the ones that hurt this little girl and yet nobody's ridiculing them nobody's watching them neil and linda said they would be questioned about everything that they did with ellie how they dressed her what they did with her they were even told that they let her do too many extracurricular activities this is when she was a little bit older and they said she loves to do that all the other little kids her age are doing it and they were just questioned so long about that and you know it was something that they weren't doing to make anybody mad they were trying to make ellie happy but they really did a great job of not ever showing this side of things to Ellie. Now, of course, she could have picked up little things here and there as kids do because they're brilliant, but she had already been through so much, so they really wanted to keep all of this away from her as far as what was happening with her parents because to her, Linda and Neil were her parents. She knew they were her grandparents, but she also knew they were the only ones who ever took care of her. Now, by August 2008, Ellie was almost two years old when her grandparents would be awarded full guardianship of her, and they thought this is when all of the troubles would end. Ben was also charged with inflicting bodily harm on Ellie and pled not guilty, but was found guilty at trial and sentenced to 18 months in jail on March 24th, 2009. Jeannie was pregnant again by this point by Ben and she had this child that was immediately taken into foster care as well because she was still saying that Ben was innocent and wholeheartedly believed this and there were a lot of other factors that made them decide that her other baby needed to be in a safer environment as well. This is when everything would take an awful turn. You see, Ben had appealed his sentence and by June 17th, 2010, when Ellie was three years old, he would be released from jail. And he was no longer thought to have harmed his daughter, meaning everybody else, including the public, believed that this had been a miscarriage of justice. He had been accused of harming this baby when he didn't. At this point, Ben and Jeannie were still being looked at as unfit parents and couldn't get Ellie back. All this time, Ellie had been with her grandparents and was in a loving and safe home environment where she was thriving and she was the happiest little girl. But everything was about to change. Ben and Jeannie decided to fight for the custody of their daughter and that is when Neil and Linda decided to fight back because they no longer believed Ellie was safe with their own daughter and her boyfriend. Now, they, Linda and Neil, were threatened saying that they would be taken to court, that all of their money would be taken. Social services were telling them to stop making a big deal about it, don't fight back, basically saying that Ellie wasn't their daughter and they shouldn't fight for her that didn't stop them. Visitation rights were once again put in place for Ellie to see her parents and yet again they didn't show. This literally went on for two years. They were always scheduled appointments. Linda and Neil were always there. They never showed up. They did not care to see Ellie and Ben was out of jail. He had no reason to not. But this was extremely strange considering Ben was going to the media and putting out statements that he was being kept from his daughter, that he was having to fight so hard to see her, that her grandparents weren't treating her correctly, and yet he was the one not even showing up to see her. He said they didn't dress her right and they didn't let her do anything outside of the house and he was telling this to the public so this is what the public believed about her grandparents. However, a little bit of digging, just spending, you know, a few minutes with Ellie and her grandparents, every woman would know that that was the farthest from the truth. Her grandparents wanted nothing but the best for Ellie, and they were ripping them apart in the media. Most people began to believe that Ben was an innocent father who had been wronged, and Ellie's grandparents knew the truth, but nobody would believe them, and they were not being listened to, especially because people thought that they were the bad ones. They had spent all of their savings on custody battles trying to get lawyers and to get her to not go back to her parents, and their money had completely run out. At this point, there was court appointed private social workers so the social workers who had been with the grandparents and the parents and had seen what was happening and knew it was best for ellie 
they were kind of thrown away and private ones were brought in who never saw Ellie before to look over her grandparents and her parents and decide what was best for her. On October 12th of 2012, the custody of Ellie Butler would be determined. Now, Neil would take the stand and be asked why he didn't like his daughter and her boyfriend, and he would point blank say, because they shook my baby granddaughter that he hated them from the bottom of his heart. With the statements from these private social workers, Justice Mary Hogg decided that she would give the custody of Ellie Butler back to her parents. She said, Ben was a thoughtful and reflective guy who couldn't have harmed his daughter, who was wronged in this miscarriage of justice. Neil stood up at that moment and said, I hope you and your colleagues have a conscience because one day you all might have blood on your hands in regards to my granddaughter, Ellie. He told them to write that in their notes because he was worried they had made an awful mistake. Neil believed that Ben was so manipulative he was able to trick the justice into thinking he was some good man when it was all just an act that Neil could see right through and when he said this to the justice, all she said was, it's not personal. But just because it wasn't personal to her doesn't mean it wasn't personal to Ellie's grandparents who had fought so hard to keep her safe. Everyone thought that Neil was crazy, but no one cared what this would do to Ellie. She had been with her grandparents her entire life. She didn't know anything different and now she was going to be ripped away for seemingly no reason to her and really no reason when you look back on this custody battle. A week after that, Ben and Jeannie would then go on a morning show to claim their innocence, which was no longer necessary because they already had custody of Ellie. It was truly just a show that they were putting on to make sure that nobody was against them, that everybody thought this was the best decision for Ellie and that they had been wrong before. They were trying to clear their name. At five years old, the world that Ellie had grown to love would be destroyed. You see, on the morning of November 9th, there would be a knock on her grandparents' door and social workers would say they were taking Ellie immediately. They were taking her to school and she would go to her parents after that and live with them. Linda immediately said, no, I am taking my granddaughter to school. I am telling her goodbye and you are going to let me do it with my husband. They argued with her, told her she couldn't, and she demanded to. And that is when they were told, fine, but you will not tell her where she is going. You will not explain to her what is happening. And you will not say goodbye. And they drove her to school, they dropped her off, and they told her goodbye as if she was just going to be back with them the next day. Now that sounds horrific, right? This is what actually happens in the foster care system when the courts decide they're going back to their birth family and whether they're with another relative, whether they're with a foster family, there is no transition period. There is no integrating the children back into these homes with their birth parents that they haven't known or been with in years. There is a plucking out of the secure, safe area they've been in and dropping into a home and a place they know nothing about. Now, most foster parents don't get to see the kids after this. They are taken back to their birth parents and they never see them again. However, because Neil and Linda were relatives, they asked their daughter for visits and sometimes they would be granted them, not often, but one of those visits would concern them greatly. See, it had been 11 months since her parents had gotten Ellie back and it was October 27, 2013, and her mother agreed to meet her grandparents at a McDonald's to let them see Ellie. But when she first walked in, I mean, she had mismatched shoes, she had dirty clothes, crazed hair like it hasn't been brushed in forever, and she had bruises on her face that almost looked like they'd been covered with makeup. Her mother ended up saying when they were looking at Ellie that she couldn't be bothered anymore. And every time Ellie would speak, 
Cheney would kind of get anxious, as though she feared that Ellie was going to tell her grandparents something that she didn't want them to know. During these visits, Ellie would often ask her grandparents when she was coming home, and home to her was their house. She said she would rather live at her grandparents' house for a hundred million years than go back to her parents but nobody listened to Ellie. After this, Jeannie pulled Ellie out of the booth and said that they had to leave. And Ellie turned around and waved goodbye to her grandparents and they walked out the door. The next day, 911 would get the call that Ellie was deceased and an officer would show up at Neil and Linda's house to tell them the news and they said they did this because they had had Ellie for so long and they wanted to let them know from an officer and they knew what the officer was going to say the minute she appeared on the doorstep, but it completely broke them to hear what she had to say. They had known that Ellie wasn't safe, but they couldn't do anything about it. And now, unfortunately, after she was already gone, they would get a voice because investigators would bring them in to be questioned as well. They told investigators they believed Ben was guilty and that Jeannie did nothing to stop him. Jeannie was still saying that she couldn't believe Ben would ever be the type of guy to do this. She never used Ellie's name. And this was completely opposite to what they found in Jeannie's diary saying that Ben was hateful and aggressive and abusive and scary. Some say that this is due to the domestic abuse that Jeannie was suffering, that she was scared to come forward and tell on Ben, and that could be very true. But I think the one thing that could make you speak up would be your own daughter's murder. Ben would be charged with murder and Jeannie with child cruelty, and their trial would be April 19th of 2016. However, Ellie's grandma, Linda Gray, would not be in attendance at this court date, and that is because she had just passed away from cancer and she had actually told Neil and everybody around her not to tell her daughter that she passed away. She didn't want to give her that right of knowing. So Neil walked alone into the courtroom that day for Linda and for little Ellie. And Ben began to say that the day that Ellie died, he was she was watching a Peppa Pig cartoon where she was jumping on the furniture and she was doing this when she fell and hit her head. Yet the injuries from the coroner would come back saying it was as though she had been in a high speed crash. That could not have happened with her falling from the furniture. It was also found that around the time of Ellie's death, Jeannie had been called from where she worked to go home. She had taken a taxi home and then they waited an hour after that to call 911. And at that point, that is when they were doing CPR, when she was already dead. There was also a video found from inside the Butler residence where you can hear Ben yelling and Ellie is just standing there with a bruised eye as if someone had punched her in the face. Don't ask me to do something, but you ain't done. I didn't sort it out. No a witness who saw Jeannie head home that day from work had heard her say on the phone, you've done what? And then in letters between Jeannie and Ben, she would say things like, I want you more than anything, even my kids. And this was after he would call her ugly and fat and just like bully her and to her grasping at anything to make him love her again. Ellie was also found to have a fractured shoulder that had never been treated from a month prior to when she had passed away. Thankfully, Ben Butler was found guilty and sentenced to life, and Jeannie Gray was also found guilty and sentenced to three years. But Ellie's grandfather seems to be the only one who feels true guilt and this is for letting his granddaughter go back to them. Watching him talk about how their little family was so happy and how he did everything he could, but he still should have done more, it wasn't his fault. It's a system that is messed up, a system that cares more about doing the right thing in their records, in their system, than about the children at all. And they are real problems he's standing up against. It's not just a one-off thing. It's things that happen 
so often and I think that Justice Hogg was manipulated by a man who was really good at making everybody think he was innocent. She has yet to say anything in regards to the Butler family. Now Neil wrote her a letter saying, Dear Justice Hogg, to say that Ellie's death has caused complete and utter devastation is an understatement. Ellie was our shining light. She was a beautiful, bubbly, intelligent little girl who always had a smile on her face. It would be helpful if you could acknowledge our family's pain and anguish. Just simply say sorry. She never has. And ultimately, no, it's not just the judge's fault. It's the system that decided that her parents should get a second chance. It's the system that let Ben go. It's the system that decided that where Ellie wanted to be didn't matter. This isn't a fluke case, and it's not unlikely to happen again. It happens every day to some child out there who's ripped from a safe home and put back to a home where they were originally taken from, where they're not being treated right, or to even a foster family that doesn't treat them right. They are constantly ripped away. And no, I'm not saying that every birth family is abusive. There are many reasons for children to be put into foster care. It doesn't mean they have to stay with a foster family or a relative if their parents are willing to put in that work and willing to be good people and change their life around for their child, that's one thing. But we have to really be sure before we put them back in the situation that they escaped from. It's just that they're throwing these children back and forth and back and forth and then just saying, there you go, when they finally place them with who they think is best. And to think that that is only a fraction of what little Ellie went through. Her grandfather, Neil, has since gone on talk shows talking about what is happening in these systems and hoping to get the awareness out, which is why I'm doing this case, because he really does want to make a difference, and I think that he should, and he can, and I completely support him. And he has actually since completely disowned his own daughter, Jeannie. Now, I do want to point out that Neil after the fact, after it was found that Ben did harm his daughter, he would go on the same talk show that Jeannie and Ben went on when they were claiming their innocence, saying that they were such wonderful people, that it was a miscarriage of justice, and these interviewers had completely believed Ben and were fooled by him, were manipulated by him, and completely said, yeah, you deserve to have your daughter back. Then they, when they brought Neil on the show, they didn't even listen to what he was saying. They basically continued to bring up that there were videos of Ben being a good dad and they couldn't believe he wasn't a good dad, further being manipulated by him, even as he was incarcerated. And Neil was sitting there trying to say, you know, you were fooled by him. And they just kept cutting him off, saying basically that that wasn't true. Now a social worker actually went on with Neil to this talk show to talk about the social services part of this whole case. And she was basically saying that the courts decided to go with the private social workers because, well, the social workers had become comfortable with Neil and Linda and with Ben and Jeannie and had really come to know who they really were, meaning they were starting to get a grasp on the fact that Ben wasn't exactly who he portrayed himself being, meaning, they were no longer being manipulated. And of course this would make a difference in the court case because they saw through a killer. So they brought in new ones who were easily fooled by him because they didn't have much time to really get to know who he was. So of course they said that Ellie should go back to him. Now Neil is the type of person that could change everything and that's why I'm giving him the spotlight. I mean, listen to Ellie's story, really listen, absorb it and know that something needs to be done. This could have been prevented, this should have been prevented and there is no reason why I should be talking about it today because there's no reason why it should have happened. I feel like I'm getting really worked up but you guys know if you've watched what happened to my 19 siblings video foster system is something i know far too much about and i know the dark side of it you know you hear all the time foster parents are bad they're horrible they're the problem some of them can be yes but it's not all of them it's not most of them most of them want to help 
until they are so burnt out, so tired of losing children and seeing how damaging the foster system is that they have to quit doing it. Neil actually thinks that part of the reason his wife died is because of all the stress of this case. These families that are keeping the children safe and loved should not have to go through this level of heartache just because the system decides to ignore the signs. And most importantly, these children's lives shouldn't be in the hands of people who don't care about their well-being. In 2018, an inquest was done into Ellie's case and it was found that authorities were not responsible for her murder. However, even the social workers who worked the case and many around it said that the entire system let down Ellie Butler, basically admitting to it. Now, Neil said, I believe the agencies involved with Ellie's care have blood on their hands. They were not called to account in the coroner's conclusion, despite the fact that they accepted they had let Ellie down. My concern is that this could happen again to another child. And unfortunately, there's a good chance they will unless we make a difference. And the sad thing is, it's so messed up, I'm not sure how. I'm sorry. If, you know what, I'm not sorry. I got emotional in this video and I think that's okay. I have special insight into this case and I hope from telling my stories, you kind of feel like you have a special insight into the foster system too. I truly hope I didn't offend anybody, whether you are in the foster system, whether you've been adopted, whether you work in the foster care system. I think the system as a whole is messed up. There are some great people in it. There are some people trying to make a change. Every person does matter and every person who speaks up and wants to make a change is one step closer to getting a better system. Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. Oh, wrong hand, bye.